Jesus, for whom the bell tolls. I found out, and doing a little research, of course, this is a very famous book, right? Uh, am I correct, John Steinbeck? No. It's about a Civil War uh, event. Uh, it follows the story of someone fighting in the Civil War. And, but I forget, oh, who, who's the author? Anyway, yes, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, uh, she didn't write everything, actually. There, there are some books and, and things that people read. But also the title that Hemingway gave to this book comes from a poem. And the poem is For Whom the Bell Tolls. And later in the service, I'm going to uh, we'll read that poem. But I want to, uh, to refer back to the scripture uh, in the Holy Bible. This is the New International Version in Matthew. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, Close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. You know, sometimes, especially when I go out, you know, selling my wood roses and things like that. And of course, uh, I, th I think about praying, but what am I going to pray about? Am I going to explain to God, hey, look, God, I hope someone's going to buy some of these wood roses from me. I need to make a certain amount of money today. I mean, is this news to God? Does he not understand, even before I, I got out of the van, that I have these wood roses in my hands for a purpose? And that is to be able to sell them? So why would I be praying about that? I mean, especially since the same thing happened the day before, and the day before, and the day before. I mean, did God forget? Is God not as smart as I am? He doesn't know what I'm there for? So prayer, you know, here even, uh, God is telling us in not so many words that we're meant to pray. I'm sorry. But we're meant to be able to pray in a way that can be uh, personal and relate to God. This is talking about heart. A artistic relationship with with God. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be that your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So this is the very famous prayer that Jesus taught us. It's very basic. Honor God, you know, pray for, you know, just ask for the basics that you need for life. Uh, forgive 
when, when you know, when it says debts and debtors, but then it goes on to explain what it really means is sin. When people do something wrong against you, forgive them. Because you're inevitably going to do something wrong against them, and you're going to want them to forgive you. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then in the King James Version, it says, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. But the emphasis here is forgive. If you forgive, you can be forgiven. We're going to be judged and measured according to the same standard that we live. If we have a heart to forgive people, then we can have a hope that we'll be forgiven when we make mistakes. So now I want to talk about something more contemporary. This was uh, recently, I saw this on the news. I don't know if you're familiar, there's a, a very famous rock and roll character, Kid Rock, and he does a lot of concerts. And uh, he used the Confederate flag in his concerts at different occasions. So, of course, this is recent. This was a recent headline, and there was a controversy because Kid Rock and General uh, Chevrolet were doing a concert series. And so a group called the, the uh, uh, connected to, uh, uh, Detroit, because Kid Rock is from Detroit, and he does a lot of things to support uh, Detroit. And so he's uh, from Detroit, and the, I forget, it's called the National, so some group of people were protesting him for using this flag. And so he, in typical Kid Rock fashion, said, please tell the people who are protesting to kiss my, and then ask me some questions. So this, this kind of came to me as I'm going through the news, and I thought to myself, well, this is, you know, pretty typical. But there's much more to this story than meets the eye. So I hope, I want to try to show a video that took place uh, five years ago. Because five years ago, uh, Kid Rock was going to be at the NCAA, or the National, at the NA, NAACP, NAACP in Detroit was honoring him at an event for the things that he did. And there were a lot of, there was a group of people that were protesting. This was, remember, this is five years ago. Five years ago. They were protesting against him receiving this award because he used the Confederate flag in some of his uh, shows. So there was a news report. It's only five minutes long, and there were three news people there, and they were discussing the issue. And I watched this, and I was fascinated by what they were talking about and the whole way it was approached. But you have to remember, this is five years ago, before this situation came up about the flag. I hope this is going to work. Go back again, because you skipped it. You have to go back and then forward once. Are you reading it from the USB stick? Well, I, I don't know. The USB stick is in there. You can just click on it. It's in the stick, right? Yeah, but We're connected to the internet, right? You don't need me in there. Well, just go ahead and play it. Uh, try to uh, get it to work just by clicking and have, put, having it part of the PowerPoint, but we're not able to do that. Ah, uh, doesn't work because uh, Windows Media Center. Uh, well, then just go to the internet and find it. It's there. Might have been that first. 
first, yeah, that's it. Turn the spell on, please. Confederate flag. But there's one important issue. 
he doesn't fly the Confederate flag at any of his concerts. He hasn't since that event at the NAACP. Because exactly what that prophet <laughs> on the radio station said happened. Kid Rock himself, when he was at that event, he was so moved and humbled by the experience that he completely took away the flag and stopped using it. And hasn't used it in any of his concerts. In May 2011, Kid Rock stepped up to the Cobo Center podium to accept the Great Expectations Award from Detroit's NAACP, describing himself as humbled and overwhelmed by the moment. That was the night, says the spokesman for the Detroit Star, that Kid Rock quietly decided he would stop using the Confederate flag on stage. Amid ongoing protests about Rock's association with the controversial symbol, his team spoke with the Free Press on Wednesday to address the situation. It was the first detailed response from the musicians' camp since a group of Detroit civil rights protesters launched a campaign against Rock and tour sponsor Chevrolet on July 6th. It's been more than five years since he's had that flag on tour, says publicist Nick Stern. They're protesting something he's not even doing. Stern's assertion aligns with observations from Kid Rock concert goers interviewed by the press. Everybody at the concert sees it. There's no flag at his concerts. His concerts don't have anything to do with that flag anymore. Prior to the 2011 NAACP event where flag protesters rallied outside, it had already been more than a year since Rock featured a Confederate flag in concert. So this is an example of things that we are exposed to in the media that seem on the surface to be sort of cut and dried. But in reality, there's so much more going on behind the scenes. Things that we often don't realize or understand or are aware of. And it references back to where God says, when you're doing good deeds, you don't go out and do the good deeds and make sure everybody sees that you're doing good deeds because you want the attention and you want, you know, your, uh, uh, well, I used the crude word that you are, you use in association with people that do all these good deeds and they want the attention. Or when you pray, you're not praying to put on a show. You're praying to connect to the living God. If you do something good, you're supposed to be doing it because it's something that comes from your heart, something that comes from inside of you. And uh, I did the research on this entire issue. You know, Kid Rock is a father of, uh, he has a biracial son, and is going to have a biracial grandson. And Kid Rock, in no sense of the word, has ever been racist or prejudiced or bigoted. He just, like anyone else growing up, he, you know, at a, at a time in his life, there was the rebel flag, and he associated it with the southern rock music that he sung, and he waved it like anyone else did. But, so the issue is much deeper. This is the flag that Kid Rock has at his concerts. But not only that, I did a little more research, and I found out that during the, uh, the presidential campaigns four years ago, Kid Rock was invited by Mitt Romney, and he played music for Mitt Romney, and he said publicly, he said, oh, Mitt Romney's one of the nicest guys I ever met. He's really conservative. But he has a very close friend, a friend by the name of Sean Penn. Does anybody know Sean Penn? Wow, very famous actor. He's a very tough guy. And he's not a conservative-minded person in any sense of the word. He's a completely on the other side. But Kid Rock and Sean Penn are actually close friends. And so they got together, and they made a commercial. And in that commercial, it's very funny, and I, I'm not going to show it to you here, but Kid Rock is, you know, Sean Penn is sitting in a bar drinking and the TV comes on and it's a, a commercial for uh, Mitt Romney. 
And he says, oh, can you turn that thing off? You know, he tells the waitress at the bar, can you turn that off? And it's a, it's a fancy bar where people are eating in the background and, you know, there's tables and he's sitting at the bar stool. And he's, you know, oh, God, you know, this, this is Sean Penn. And then uh, and the, and the waitress doesn't turn it off immediately. And on the screen is Kid Rock playing music for Mitt Romney. <laughs> and, uh, and he's sitting there going, oh. And, this, and the screen goes off. And in the middle of a song that Kid Rock is singing, and then from the back of the room, you hear Kid Rock's voice singing the song. And he's then you see this, and he, Kid Rock is sitting on the other side of the bar, surrounded by a bunch of girls and stuff, and he's drinking a beer. And he looks over and he sees Sean Penn. So he walks over to Sean Penn, and he sits down and he says, Hope and change, huh? Yeah, yeah, people are hoping that they'll get to keep some of the change that they pay the tax, you know, and he goes on and on with all these conservative type sayings. And he runs through a whole litany of them. And then Sean Penn stands up and he goes, and he runs through this whole litany. Oh, you know, you, you know, whale loving, you know, uh, you know, gas guzzling, blah, blah, you know, and all these things, and they go back, and, and there's this battle going back and forth. It's, it's very funny, you know, but it's, they use very crude language. It's x-rayed. They call each other really mean names. And then, uh, through the, a, a young lady walks through the middle of them, and she says, I'm from Jamaica, Mom. You know, I, 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 I spent uh, five years trying to get come into this country. You complained about this country. You don't understand the freedom that you have in this country. And for a moment, you know, they're taken back. And then they, they go back at it, you know, they, they start joking with each other, making fun of her. So both of them are kind of making fun of her. And then the TV comes on and there's a, suddenly a report about a terrorist attack on a bunch of soldiers. And they're both sitting in the bar. And they're listening to this report. And then they both are quiet. And they're both tearing up and crying. And then Kid Rock looks at Sean Penn and says, hey man, I really didn't mean to say all those things. I said, no. And then their heart changes toward each other. And then the commercial, <laughs> then it shows them going out together. And it has all this very uh, oh, ridiculously you know, it's like la di da music, and they're, they're driving together, and Sean Penn is taking Kid Rock out, and he's at a, a dealer, and he's going to buy a Prius, and, uh, and then Sh and, and Kid Rock is taking Sean Penn to the gun range, and, and they're all, you know, lovey-dovey with each other. It's just a comedy skit, really. But they really made that. They came together. They're really friends. That, that's, that's real. Those kinds of things are really going on. That's the heart of, tr of true Americans and real America. And uh, Kid Rock, in one of his interviews, he talked about how uh, his good friend, he and Sean Penn, you know, they got together to make that commercial and they were so happy and they really enjoyed it and because they were so tired of the, of the, the this was four years ago, they were so tired of the, the bickering and the, 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 the half-truths and the, the, the lies and the, um, the stereotyping. That's the word I'm looking for, stereotyping. You know, thinking that you know what another person believes because they're connected to a label. You know, the color of their skin, the political party that they're a part of. Oh, I know who you are because you're conservative, because you're a liberal, because you're a Catholic, because you're black, because you're you, because you grew up in this country, but we don't. We don't know. We don't know what's going on. Only God really knows what's going on. And true parents understood the fundamental truth of what the principle is really all about. In Matthew, it says Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seeds in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, 
Then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. When I read this and I think about the real meaning of this, is God is telling us, don't judge too quickly. God is unbelievably patient in all circumstances and situations. And when God is looking at our situation, He is not just looking at us alive in the physical world. God is thinking of our eternal life, our eternal existence. And our eternal existence revolves around our spiritual self, our spiritual mind, our spiritual body, our spiritual maturity. And the providence of restoration through indemnity has always been to raise up, to resurrect, to educate the spirit. So even if the physical has to be sacrificed, it's much more important to preserve and to protect and to support the spiritual growth that has to take place. So here in this, in this uh, parable, I see God is saying in, in, in this situation, these circumstances, God is saying, you know, be careful how you treat each other. Be careful to judge each other too directly or too quickly because you'll damage, you'll damage that which is good. And in terms of the spirit, when we're dealing with people's spirits, their personality, their character, then we have to be very careful how we judge or how we educate or how we correct or how we try to let a person know they're, they're doing something wrong. Some things are very obvious. Rape, murder, stealing. Obviously, nobody supports that. You know, the other day, have you heard of the TV show, What Would You Do? You know, John, what's his name? John, can you, uh, he's Hispanic. He come, he, they go around and they set up situations with actors in different parts of America, and they have actors and actresses come in and do things to see how would you be respond? What would you do? Well, they were doing all this stuff in Texas concerning guns. But they did a bit, this was last Sunday, I watched, I watched it, about two gay men sitting in a room in a, in a restaurant and behaving in you know very lovey-dovey way toward each other. And they had one a young lady in the room who was also acting, who would out loud, oh, that's disgusting, oh, you know, they should leave, they should get out of here, look at that, this is Texas, these are two men. You know, that kind of behavior, right? So the whole point was, what would the people in the restaurant do? I was a little surprised, actually. I was a little surprised and how incredibly tolerant all of those Texans were. The overwhelming majority were upset with this woman. And they were, they went, said, some of them didn't say it out loud, but they went to the owner of the restaurant, they said, look, this woman's got to go, this is terrible. You know, she's treating these guys bad. And at some points, they even had this woman quietly sit with people and talk with them. I like that, what do you think? And in most of the cases, these people were defending these two gay men. Even though they, they didn't agree, you know, some of them made it very clear. Well, I don't, I don't like it myself, no, but, you know, they have a right to be there. And I was, I was kind of surprised. I was a little shocked. How tolerant, how, you know, we, we're, we're told America is such a bad country. 
concerning race, concerning gays, concerning so many things. But the reality is actually very different. It's not like that. Now, obviously, there are individuals. Obviously. That woman represented a certain kind of individual. A very loud-mouthed, bigoted person. But she was not received in any sense of the word. She was a minority. And, and I, was, I was pleasantly inspired and surprised. And so that brings us to things that are happening today that I know we are burdened by and even confused about. It's an age of confusion, right? Like this, this guy, his, his name is, I'm not sure, his name is Bruce Jenner, but he looks like he now he wants to go by Caitlyn Jenner, and he was at these awards. This is one of his wives. He was married a couple of times. And he, obviously, you all know that he changed partially into a woman. And there's all this, oh, this big deal about this is going on. He received this award at the sports event. But at the end of the day, when all is said and done, and the dust settles, and all the the, 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 the fireworks, you know, and the, it all goes off. He is who he is. And he is. This is his son. And he still, his son gives him a Father's Day card, thanks him for being his father. He 100% admits, acknowledges, he said to his son, look, you're my son, I'm your father. That's never going to change. So what we're dealing with here is a particular person who is going through a very interesting circumstance in his life. It happens to be very public because of who he was. He happens to have been an Olympic champion. And he was one of the Kardashians, married to her. And so him going through these things is obviously, I mean, for Hollywood and you know the world around us, this is a big, a big news. It's a big deal. But in reality, like I said, when when all is said and done, we are all individual people who are either men or women. And the overwhelming majority of us do not have to deal with this kind of a situation or circumstance. The overwhelming majority of us are dealing with other issues and circumstances, which is similar. You know, I was reading a story concerning this whole issue of him receiving this award, and there was a debate on a news program, just like the one we just saw, and they had different people and there was this one person who was complaining about him receiving this award, saying, what did he ever do for the lesbian and gay community in reality? What did he do in the 1970s? What did he do in the 1980s? What did he do in the 1990s? What did he do in, from 2000 to 2000? How did he represent in any way, shape, or form the lesbian and gay community? Because he was completely you know, to himself. He didn't share this information with anyone. So this person, who actually is a gay and lesbian person, is complaining about him receiving the award. Because he doesn't represent their community. A different point of view. So why, why am I talking about this? Because this, these issues, people, relationships that we have with people, with our, each other, even in our own family, I'm sure our families face this issue. Some of our sons and daughters might be gay or lesbian. I'm not sure. I know when I first joined our church in our movement, there were many gay, gay brothers that, that were in our movement. When Reverend on's 40 day training, they came out many times. Some ex very extreme cases. It's always been there, actually. How many, how many gay brothers and sisters, gay and lesbian brothers and sisters, 
have been matched and blessed by true parents. Some of them have. Is it, is it an issue? Is it something that is God can't deal with? No. God is dealing with it. Believe me, God is dealing with it. You know, this guy, Bruce Jenner, he's a very interesting person. He, he brought this out after all these years, and he's, he's trying to deal with it. It's an issue that he has to deal with. But again, we shouldn't be afraid or, uh, what's the word? We, we shouldn't be fooled or we shouldn't be confused or we shouldn't be uh, unclear about the standard of true love. God wants us to maintain the standard of true love. But we have to realize that that standard of true love is very deep, very profoundly deep. And before we judge another person because of the things that they're thinking and feeling, you know, it's one thing for a person to grab a gun and go into a public place and kill innocent people. But when a person is deep inside their soul, wrestling with their nature, their, their, their human nature, am I a man, am I a woman? You know, or they have these feelings, they have these desires. Who am I to, from the outside, to uh, judge and accuse and point a finger and say, oh, this is evil, this is disgusting, this is dirty, this is a... Yeah, from a certain perspective of the principle, God designed and created the universe, men and women. And that is the overwhelming majority, and that is the, pro the, the direction the pro uh, life is going. Life is going in that direction. We don't have to worry about that. But along the way, because of the fall of man, there are people who can't, who don't have the same blessing that we have, who are not in the same spiritual situation that we are. So our mission, if you want to call it that, the purpose of our life is to embody the true love of God, become a true couple, become a true husband and wife, become true parents, and love unconditionally the children. Love unconditionally your friends, your neighbors. And let God sort it out. Be careful. Don't, you know, don't throw weed out with the chafe. If you have friends that are in these situations or sons and daughters that are in these situations, don't worry. You know, I, 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 that's the, the point. Don't worry. You know that saying, you know, be patient. God is not finished with me yet. Don't worry. There's much more to life than meets the eye. So again, this whole situation with, you know, even with Bruce Jenner and this situation, believe me, believe me, behind the scenes, be behind things that we don't know in his family, between himself and his children, between himself and his former wives, between himself and God. He's a spiritual man. He's a person who prays. When he was a young man growing up, he desperately prayed to God. God, what's wrong with me? What's going on? Do you not feel and believe that God will help him? Will, will touch his life? In his own time. In his own way. God knows better. God knows better than you or me. God even knows better than true parents. True parents are limited. Limited by time and space, by certain capacity to have information. But their heart, they establish the heart, the heartistic relationship, making a condition so that God can bless this world. And he is. He's working in amazing ways. So remember this part of the Divine Principle, directly from the Divine Principle book, the last part of resurrection. The ultimate purpose of God's providence of restoration is to save all of humanity. Therefore, 
God intends to abolish hell completely after the passage of time necessary for each individual to make restitution for his sin. When is hell going to be abolished? After the passage of time necessary for each individual to make restitution for his or her or its or their sin. And sin in this word means whatever is separating them from God, whatever is preventing them from becoming their true self, whether it's a mistake that they made, whether it's a desire that they have, whether it's a person that they abused that they have to repent to and receive forgiveness from, in time, if not in this world, then in the next, everyone will have the opportunity to grow and become the true self that they are meant to be. If hell were to remain eternally in the world where God's purpose of goodness is fulfilled, it would contradict the perfection of God, His ideal, and His providence of restoration. Even fallen parents cannot feel joyful when one of their children is unhappy. Is this not even more true for God, our heavenly parent? It is written, The Lord is forbearing toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Accordingly, hell cannot remain forever. No trace of hell will remain in the ideal world, which is the fulfillment of God's deepest desire. In the last days, when the time is right, evil spirits will descend to evil people on earth of the same spiritual level and assist them to accomplish God's will. I think the, the word evil here is very harsh. But the point is, spirits that are not yet perfect. <laughs> Spiritually, people that haven't really achieved the ideal will descend. And they will affect people on the same spiritual level and assist them to accomplish God's will. Assist them to do what? To accomplish God's will. Ultimately, how? That part we can't be clear about. There are many ways people end up accomplishing God's will. Biker. Even, indeed, even the demons testified that Jesus was the Son of God. By participating in these various dispensations over a long course of time, all people will gradually converge toward the goal of God's ideal world. That's what's happening. We're all converging. We're converging toward the goal of God's ideal world. Absolutely. So, externally and superficially, as incidents happen, events take place. You know, recently this, this person went into Chattanooga, Tennessee, killed five soldiers. Yeah, it's terrible. It's awful. But these are isolated events of, of sin, of, 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 of people struggling with evil. And sometimes still, the innocent, the, 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 the people that are good end up paying the price, sacrificing, so that ultimately God will be able to unravel the fallen reality. So let's look at the poem, For Whom the Bell Tolls. No man is an island entire of itself. Each is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. As well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thine own or of thine friends were, each man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind. Therefore, send not to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. The bell tolling is a funeral. When you hear the bell, it means someone has died. So you're, oh, who died? Who's suffering? 
Who's struggling in their life? Don't ask. Because the bell tolls for us. The bell tolls for you. It tolls for me. We're all in this together. No man is an island. I want to conclude with uh, some of Father's words. Father said in this 1977 speech, the best way for you to safely journey through this period is to put yourself down on the lowest possible level, where you could even envy the beggars, where even sitting down at a table to eat becomes a luxury. Servants do not have the luxury of sitting down to eat at a big table with napkins and wines and so forth. We must put ourselves in the position of servants of servants. With that attitude, you can leap forward, and then you can understand humanity. Until I was 30, I never bought even one suit for myself, and for the clothes I did get, I always went to a second-hand store. I never wore ties or used hair tonic or body care items. During those years, I put myself in a sinner's position. I never had the courage to lift my face up, but was always looking down. Nature is asking to be seen by the true man. But unless I could fulfill my dispensational role, I did not feel privileged to even look at nature. I was so humble in my thinking that I wanted to hide in the presence of nature. Now I go to movies. But at that time, I never even walked in front of a movie theater. Now I have graduated from that path, and nothing can affect what I have accomplished. I have perfected that course and transcended it. I am like a rock, and no one can entice me away from God's will. There were many women who actually wrote love letters to me with their own blood, showing their genuine devotion to me. The religious path is not easy because of the many temptations around, and you have no idea what it takes to lay the foundation. But I have done it, and I am freely sharing the fruits of it with you. No one has the right to complain. Rather, continually be grateful and put yourself in a meek position. Even now, that is my basic attitude toward God. After all the dispensational success so far, I still put myself in a humble position before God. I, in my experiences with Father, all these years, I truly believe that he was sincerely humble. Even though sometimes he spoke very powerfully and very, you know, you could even say arrogantly, you know, about his position. But he was only telling the truth of who he was and what he came to do and what he meant to accomplish and what he would accomplish. But inside his mind and heart, true parents are humble and simple and passionate and compassionate and caring and concerned. And that's the way we are meant to live our lives. As true parents did, we are to do. If we do that, the world around us might become, you know, like a storm. But as long as the center is true love, centered on true parents, and centered on the divine principle, and the core truth of the principle, then we have nothing to fear. No worries. All will be good in the end. Everything is moving in the direction toward God. If Father is the true parents, and He's the Messiah, can it be any other way? What's the alternative? You know, again, many times, I've had the conversation with people. You can hear many people complaining about Father, you know, oh, Reverend Moon this, Reverend Moon that, he brainwashing people. Many of the, the brainwashing, he didn't brainwash anybody. Oh yeah, but he's building an arms factory, he's going to get guns, and he's going to, nope, never happened. All of these things, just like the accusations against Kid Rock, people are accusing him of something he's not doing. And we know that happened with true parents. Bold face lies. But even beyond that, even beyond the lies, even beyond the obvious, it's very, very difficult.
without knowing the divine principle, without really trying to see from God's point of view, it's very difficult to understand father or mother or even any of what the true children are going through. But make no mistake, the principle is the principle. The true parents are the true parents. The victory of God is the victory of God. And we, the blessed families, are the children of the sons and daughters. So let us live every day making our own effort, dealing with our own fallen nature, and finding the way to love unconditionally the people around us. Whether they're our own husband or wife, or our neighbors, or you know, maybe strangers. Your father was a very simple man, especially a man of prayer. So when in doubt, just pray. Pray and put it in God's hands. Because God knows much better than us what's really going on. We do not know. We have no idea what God is capable of. But rest assured, He is working His way into the minds and into the hearts of every person because of the providence of restoration is completed and fulfilled. Okay. All right. Uh, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Parent God, thank you for reminding us about the victory of our true parents, that we are living at a time when true love is possible. It's not just possible, it is manifested through blessed families. We all struggle together. We're all facing the same challenges and the same difficulties. You didn't make it in a way that we would be separated from mankind, or that we would be better than mankind. You made it in such a way that we are mankind, that we are each other. We are not an island. No man is an island. And who, the, who does the bell toll for? It tolls for me, it tolls for us. We're all in this together, and we're going through it together. But help us to go through it centered on this great victory of the true parents, the great victory of the establishment of the tradition of the blessing and of true love in the families. And centered on true love, everything will be unraveled. Everything will become clear as time goes on. Thank you for your patience with us. Incredible patience all through history. You didn't want to hurt us. You didn't want to to throw away the wheat uh, with the weeds, but you patiently work inside our minds and in our hearts to help us until we can finally grow up and become real citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Thank you again and again. We pray that you'll bless this day and the time that we spend together. And please be with each uh, a brother and sister, each blessed family, and with uh, true parents, true father in the spirit world, and true mother here on earth and with the true children, each one of them, uh, going through their course of finding their own identity and who they really are and what their relationship with you and with true parents and with each other and with us is. Heavenly Father, we pray for the will to, of heaven to be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we offer our prayers and report this in our names as blessed central families. In my name, John Pace, Sharon Pace, blessed central family. Amen. And I'll